that if you're not classifying them correctly, but you're still paying them correctly, it'll still be a payroll violation. If, if it's below the classification right. that she sold them as. Right. 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 If it's below. As long as you're, if you're listing them at the highest and you're paying them the highest. Because some, like I said, you know, some people do. They, they'll go from place to place and say, I can't, I can't keep track of that when you pay them at the highest. Put them at the highest classification on your on the way you put it there, and you're good. All right. Another question here. I don't know your name. Oh, Michelle. Michelle. So in the case where <laughs> all right, just a minute. Let's hear what Michelle says. In the case where, let's say the contractor wants to report each of the classifications and report that hourly rate, how does overtime come into play? So let's say they 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 come into overtime. I know that. And that is that is difficult. They'll put the overtime in the hours of whatever they were working at. If they were working as a laborer for those overtime hours, then they would put it in that. Um, it, it, it does make it more difficult to, to figure that out. But um, I think I have another screen that shows that. But um, she's right, though. It can get into a little bit of an issue whenever you're doing overtime. All right. But again, if the daily inspector is putting it on the daily work report exactly how many hours are being worked, and, and you can compare it, and your payroll doesn't match, is way off in some way. Um, we're going to, we'll hopefully catch those sorts of things. But what you need to make sure of is that you are being as accurate as you want to be as a prime on what you're reporting. All right? You want to separate it out so that, you know, everyone knows exactly what this person is doing on each equipment. And when they switch, right, just make sure that they are meeting at least the minimums for each of those classifications you're listing them for on that payroll and on their pay web, payroll um, their check. Right. If you don't want to, if you you all have, I'm a two-man operation, I'm not trying to do all that, I'm just going to list them at the highest, I'm going to pick the highest one that he could possibly get on today. That's the equipment operator, that's what he is. That's what she is. She's an operator and I, I don't care what what type of information or you know, what type of equipment she's going to get on today, I, I don't have time for that. I'm just going to put her at the highest. I'm going to pay her at the highest. I can't put her at the highest and pay her at the lowest. Okay. That's a match. All right. But that's just, it, it just gives you options as a prime as to how you want to report it. Again, it would affect you on the overtime. That means you're paying at the highest rate. But again, to be competitive, i, I got to find somebody, you know, who can do the work. So I may have to pay a little more. So I'm going to put them down at the highest. All right. Um, Deduction standards for the Copeland Act are basic standards for de deduction. We need to get through here. As required by law, those are taxes. As requested by an employee, that means it's voluntary. This deduction can be voluntary. As benefits the employee, and it's not against any existing law. This is kind of our standard that we use when we're trying to decide if a deduction is a true de deduction. Allowable deduction versus cost of doing business. All right. You can't force people to wear a uniform to cost of doing business if you want that. If you want that to them. Now, if you want to make it voluntary that they can rent, the, rent these uniforms from you, then yes, you can do that. So that's check with your subs. That's my first thing. If, if you're going to hire a sub, say, hey, what's the deductions that you take? What do you normally do? Because I had one that got through the whole project. <laughs> and didn't realize they'd been deducting for something that they weren't required to deduct for. But if you had asked the beginning, and they were, uh, this was, Davis Bacon was added later after the project started, which is a whole other, uh, <laughs> so then you find out, oh, they're, they're, you know, they're doing something. So again, check with your subs, check what deductions they take, and if they're, you're unsure that that's an allowable thing, uh oh, I think you need USDOL approval for that, ask, all right? We'll talk about that here. Um, as required by law means those are taxes. Again, FICA, which is Social Security and Medicare put together. I see so many times they put FICA and then they put another line for Medicare. Okay, but <laughs> FICA is Medicare and your um, your Social Security. <laughs> oh my God, I got Social Security right. Got it. All right, court orders. Uh, court orders, it could be, yeah, it could be garnishments, it could be your child support, right? You've got to provide supporting documents upon request. 
Okay. I'm not going to force you to send that to me the court order, but if I ask, if I have a question, as an RCS watching over the project, monitoring, I may ask for that. So you're going to want to have it as a crime. Mm -hmm. Quick question on the providing of documents. Yes. Is that a one-time occurrence, or do you have to do it for each project? that employee is on. Do you keep that as a file or you just keep it for that project specific? You would keep it as a prime and you would keep that for that project. Not not as a prime, but as a as a RCS. The RCS is uh, it's always just specific to a project. Yep. Perfect. Yeah. Thank and, you. and yeah. And it can change again. Um, I saw one where they you know every every few months it would change a little bit. Well because after so many weeks then the fee went down and the, you know the, the garnishment went changed. So those kind of things, when it started changing, I said, well, wait a minute, what is that? So then I asked for the documentation. I didn't really need it before, but now I kind of do. So there may come a time when you'll be asked for it and, um, you know, and you've got to supply it. And it will answer any questions about deductions that were taken. Uh, now, as requested by employee means, it could be, um, some of them still might have to meet a USDOL standard. Just like um, it could be voluntary. The, um, the employee could say, hey, I want, I want this. Um, I want my employer to supply me these tools and things. I need this. All right, some things still might need USDOL approval. We'll talk about that. All right. Loans, pay advances. Okay, sometimes that happens. They get a pay advance. Again, supporting documentation may need to be, must be provided, really, for a pay advance. Because we've got to know when it started, when it's supposed to end. How much per increment? Right. Again, like their loan could go for a year and they're only working a few months here, but I've got to make sure that they're not being deducted out more than what should be. And remember, just like anything else, benefits the employee, not the employer. We'll, we'll discuss that here. All right, administration fees are not permitted. On, uh, uh, they're not a permitted deduction. Now you're going to see on um, court orders, the court order may say you're allowed to deduct $5 for administration. If it's in the court order, then the prime can deduct it, or the subcontractor can, can deduct it. All right. Florida law, they can deduct, what is it? $5 the first one, $2 after that. So um, Florida law is a little bit different. So. By law, they're allowed to have at least two dollars. They're allowed to. Some some contractors don't do an administrative fee to child support or garnishments. Employers cannot profit. Basically, you can't profit financially by imposing a fee, charging interest. I don't care how many office people it takes when you're within your office to manage that, you know, that program. You can't charge it to the employee. It's cost to do a business. All right. Deductions. Collective bargaining unions. Okay, this is a little bit trickier. Dues can be deducted. They don't need U.S. DOL approval to deduct. Again, I might want to see that. It does require employee approval. So if I ask for that approval, you've got to have it on hand there. You have to have something that's signed by the individual that says, I know this is coming out of my check. If deduction is not identified in the agreement, in that collective bargaining agreement, or it's identified on the payroll as union working assessment. That's kind of a trigger phrase, I guess, that is being used. That needs to have U.S. DOL approval. Right? Because now they want to see what that is. What's that assessment based on? And it might be true, it might be good. But U.S. DOL wants to make that call. They don't want to make it this level. They want to make that call. Right? So those are union. You're going to see a lot of electricians. When I worked down in um, uh, Miami area, there's a lot of um, you know, unions. And they would send you, the very beginning, they would send you the, sometimes they'll just automatically send you their agreement. So you can tell exactly what is there. This form here is, is deductions allowed without USDOL approval. Again, it's in the workbook, in the manual. Federal and state income taxes, social security taxes, court orders again, like child support, repayment. Without discount or interest, again, those advances can be taken out, but you have to have a signature of the person <coughs> doing it. All right, contributions to funds, medical insurance, things like that. Funds allowed to take that out. Purchase for a U.S. savings bond. <coughs> Deductions for charitable, Red Cross, United Way. 
Right? Again, it, we don't, you don't have to have your, um, your signature there for that, but something may come up later. If in a labor interview somebody says, hey, they're taking off a red cross, and I didn't, I didn't okay that, I might ask to see that. I want to see that form that they signed that gave you authorization to take that out. You're allowed to, as a, as a contractor, you don't need to get USCO approval, but you do have to have the employee approval. Alright, it's just a good practice to have that on here. Alright, um, automatic payroll deposits to a credit union. You can be on there if that's a charge. Uh, line charges me $2 at that time, okay. I'm allowed to deduct that from the, and put that off on the employee without asking USCO if I can do it. Purchase of safety equipment that's nominal. Alright, this is a reasonable cost of board and lodging. Again, if that's supplied, I had someone the other day said that they you know, they supply that, they supply hotel room, and so they want to deduct transportation to and from. That could be a certain fee. And again, that's a voluntary thing. If, if you're choosing to use this nice option from the prime or the subcontractor, then um, we're going to deduct a certain amount for the gas, you know, and all that. And again, that's something that if I questioned it, you got to show me pay for it for this. They sign for it. And the employee gives, gives the option. Um, bona fide fringe benefits that are approved in writing by an employee. Right. Um, again, it's just a good, a good practice. I've seen some, there's, there's some papers here. There's one of the crimes showed me a paper here that they used, and, and they created a form. And it has um, purpose of deduction, amount of deduction, place for signature, and they just keep this for every employee. So it can be helpful to have that, to, um, to know right away. And it's one-stop shop. I asked for it, oh, here it is. And that's what they did on this, this one project. They had all these you know, union, they had you know, books for this and this, everything was there, and it's nice and handy, right? So, again, it can be asked for, um, for documentation. There is, are you ready for me to? Yeah, sure. Um, fringe benefits from, the, you want to do this one? Patty Vickers has, hot off the press, given direction on the fringe benefit. Um, I'll follow along with it. You want to do it now? Okay. Um, it says, um, going forward, and Patty Vickers is, is um, like summarizing what she's gotten from USCOL and WA, um, the Wage and Hour Division. Um, going forward, any contractor that provides bona fide fringe benefits, as long as they are bona fide, and the list is in the workbook, Okay, of which are bona fide fringe benefits, we've talked about that. The employee does not have to have to sign or say in agreement okay, for it. They don't have to say, um, let me see what say. The employee does not have a say in the benefits that are provided by the contractor. Right? It's, it's not their choice, it's, it's the employer's choice as to what fringe benefits they're going to offer. All right? As long as the employee is at least paid the state hourly minimum wage of 805 per hour. Right, they have to make at least that amount of money. Right. This will eliminate a lot of checking on the fringes. As long as a contractor is meeting a combined rate of fringe and basic hourly rate that meets the prevailing wage rate and doesn't go below the state's minimum wage, which was 805, for that basic hourly rate and the fringes, then they've met the requirement. Right. So in other words, she's, she's saying that, that the employee doesn't have to always opt in, so to speak. All right. I, as an employer, can, can determine that um, I'm paying the, the basic rate, which is correct, and um, we're going to add fringe. I want to add fringe. And this is the fringe I'm going to do. I'm going to do AFLAC for all my people. So you're all on AFLAC. Right? You may not, you know, but I'm going, to, I'm going to offer that to my company and to my employees. That's a fringe benefit. I get to put it down as a fringe benefit for you. All right? And I'll send this notice out. This notice will go out from your RCSs to all the, um, uh, all the primes so that you will have um, an idea of, of what the new ruling is from the central office. And, and, and what's driving that is uh, USDOL has re-looked at how we're asking our documentation support fringes. 
And as long as it's a modified French, not going to be referenced in the appliance manual or in the field guide a wage and hour division, then the employee doesn't have a say in how that French is applied as long as it meets the minimum wage decision and the state's implementation. Yeah, you can't, you can't lower their, their rate. The this rate is kind of hot off the press and we this information yesterday. So, uh, if you've got questions, if you have any, if you have any RCSs, we'd be glad to go a little further in detail. But, and we'll put it in English. Because it's kind of, and lawyers speak. I mean, we kind of have to start that way and then it works its way down to being what we say. Um, but that's what, what it is on um, printed. So, deductions. All right. Um, USDOL authorized, required annually. You have to get USUL approval to do uh, to have use of a company vehicle as a deduction or a uniform rental or cell phone. Again, they usually they usually allow it, but they want to be the one to that call. They've got to look over what you what you send them. Send them as much, much information as you can, and you're gonna send it to this. The DV A deduction. Now for fringe benefits is what we were just talking about, fringe benefits, they can be funded or unfunded. All right, and that's what we're talking about, bona fide. All right, must be paid fringe amount for all hours work. All right, this is the real stickler. So many times, because remember our calculations are on 2080, which is the number of hours you work in a year. And we divide everything by that 2080. So we got to make sure that when we go over and somebody works above that many hours, that they're still receiving that fringe benefit. All right, funded and unfunded. All right, fringe benefits can be health insurance, life insurance, disability insurance, pension, 401ks, apprenticeship training. All right, those are funded, right? Goes to a third party. Payments are made to a third party. Holidays, sick leave, some sort of supplemental, pay you want to give people, vacation. Those are considered unfunded. All right, funded. We're going to show it again, contractor payments to a fund, PAN, or a program. Irrevocably, those payments go to a trustee or third party. I, as an employer, cannot just, okay, this month we're not going to make that payment. And then you get to your pension and you don't have money in there, okay? Payments are made irrevocably to a trustee or third party. <coughs> payments made regularly, at least quarterly. Sometimes we think of things annually, but they, your employer, your contractor, you have to pay those to your trustee, to that third party, at least quarterly. Cannot be claimed for employees that aren't eligible and are part-time. Don't claim a fringe benefit to them if they're not really getting any, you know, any fringe out of it. Does All the other employees are getting good, but I'm part-time. That doesn't affect me. Does that not eligible also be um, not eligible if it's a waiting period? The waiting period, if... The waiting period that you, they are, they are reasonably going to get it, so you can't. It, it, I, I don't think it applies to that. I think I started to do that whenever I, whenever I was looking at this, but the initial period, you are reasonably, the way it says it in the workbook and in the um, 1273, it, you're reasonably going to be getting this, um, this benefit. So therefore, it is, it is part and parcel from the beginning. Um, it's from what I can right from the start. Right from so the start. You're hired. Right. We don't have to say to them, you get this for now, and then when the waiting period's over. Right. And I'll check on that because that is important because some people have like a 90 day. We do. And that's, yeah, and that's a long time. Um, but uh, let me check on that and we'll send that out. When we send this out, I'll, I'll make sure of that because that was a question I had. Um, some of my notes are really long and um, those waiting periods. And um, to my mind, you can't, you know, it's not a fringe benefit them yet. But because they're you know, reasonably going to get it, uh, it, it may very well fall into the wording that was there. So I'll check on that and be sure I haven't seen it enough. So. Contributions to pensions, again, vesting requirements, and here it is. Um, monies remain in the fund. <coughs> they don't go back to the employer. If somebody leaves, if somebody leaves the uh, program, I was in a, um, a, a plan that you leave within, like before you vest, like within that first year, then those monies, that you're, you no longer get, they go back to the employer because it was an employer run program. Doesn't count. Not a good deduction. It has to go back into the plan to benefit employees, not benefit the employer. All right, um, let's see. Okay, so here we are again. There's the nozzleman. 
right now some of the quick examples. We've got disability insurance. Employer amount paid is the fringe benefit. Okay? That's what he's considering a fringe benefit. I'm the employer, that's my fringe benefit to him. All right? I'm going to pay 100 a month. All right? He may have to pay more, but I'm going to pay 100 a month of that. All right? So that's 100 times the 12 months. Gives me $1,200. I'm dividing that by 28, which is a year's worth of work. And I'm going to come up with a number. 58 cents fringe benefit. Have I met the fringe? No. I offer 58 cents? No. I got a ways to go, don't I? Yeah. So I might choose to put the rest in cash to that person, or I might have more fringes. Right, it could go on. All right, monies are not paid for an unfunded, and they're not paid by a contractor to the pension fund, to the insurance company. All right. And let's see. The contractor pays the employee as the benefit is earned. That's your vacation. That's your PTO, right? Holiday vacation, sick time. USDOL requires a contractor to set aside sufficient funds to meet that demand, right? So if somebody were to look in your books, your company books, they have to make sure. If it's ever questioned, if an employee, again, I could a labor interview somebody. And they say, hey, I was due this vacation. They said, there's no money right now. I've got to wait for my vacation. Mm -hmm. Money has to be set aside if you're using that as a deduction right? or as a fringe benefit to that employee. It's not a fringe benefit if it could ever not be his or hers. Okay? It's not a fringe benefit. Right, it has to meet these requirements like we talked about. Reasonably anticipate to be provided to the employee. <coughs> from, you know, it's it's going to be provided to the employee. Benefit is a commitment. This is how the workbook can be legally enforced. The benefit has financial responsibility, a responsible plan, a program. Uh, it's not something I made up yesterday. I'm going to make an incorporation right here. Nope. It's got to be a responsible plan. Benefit has been um, communicated in writing to the employees. Okay. It's not something you decided yesterday. And because uh, your friend has an insurance company and he needs companies to go with them, so we're going to go with them, and I haven't told anybody. Right. But I'm going to call it a fringe. All right, so there we are. And that's, why, that's what she's talking about here, here in this one, the applied fringe, is we're going to take your word for it more. We're going we're to look when we need to, but as a fringe benefit, you as an employer can make that determination of what is going to be taken out. That's kind of just what she said. She's kind of changing that a little bit. All right, the fringe, this is a fringe calculation for an unfunded. So let's say employee A <coughs> gets $10, right? He gets a 40-hour vacation pay. That, that's going to round up to $400. Right. I'm going to do the calculations. I'm going to divide that 400 by the 2080, which is standard hours, 40 hours a week, 19 cents. That's calculates out 19 cents I can put on their fridge. That's why I pay them the fridge. Alright? To meet those minimum wage rate tables. I've got 19. If they make 15, I put 1600. Now I've got 29 cents for this person. Alright? Again, if I work overtime, this is not overtime hours, this is straight time. So now I'm in another section. I've got to either pay them cash for the extra hours for their overtime. If there's fringe required to make up their pay wage, I have to make sure that I'm paying them for every hour, even for that. All right, we have your sample that's there. Let's try this. Um, uh -huh. All right. Okay, cool. When you come back, then we'll look at it. And if you see anything, we'll, we'll just go from there. Okay, sounds good. All right, folks, we ran a little over what we anticipated.